<laughs> COVID adds to some and takes from some, I guess. Well, in all fairness, I did have a weight loss surgery back in December. So, you know, that kind of came with the territory. So, so you have to learn how to eat all over again. When yeah, you do that. pretty much. I have the stomach of a baby. Ooh. <laughs> I do too, a baby elephant. A baby what? Elephant. <laughs> Hey. Yeah, I do. Sh Sheldon, I assume that's Michelle. Hi, Sheldon Michelle. should be working. Hey, Miss Melissa. Okay. Brother Bobby. Yes. Miss Josie. Good to see you guys this morning. Oh, y'all jumped, y'all jumped on quick. I'm just a couple minutes early. We're just trying to get set up. Miss Sharon, God bless you. Hey, Granny. How are you? Good. Charlie, how are you doing? You feeling all right? Good. You know what I think? I think some Ms. of us Holly. that we're going through, some of us. Miss Pat, good to see you this morning. Lag. Good you morning to you. you. Sit for so many hours, you just like jet lag. You can't get going again. Yeah. Amen. That's where the saying comes from. If you don't Charlie, you opened up again? <laughs> I know, personally, for me, it's more like six weeks. Thank before, you, Miss Sharon. Love you, too, and appreciate all you do. I really do. Yeah. God bless you. I need to be here. <laughs> um, while you guys are getting loaded in, if you've got prayer requests, go ahead and send those in, because I know it, there's a little delay in the uh, Facebook thing, you, maybe a minute, a few seconds, or whatever. Mm -hmm. So if you want to go ahead and send those Revelation, in to me. Uh, Stuart, good to see you, buddy. Hi, Yeah. Oh, mercy. We got out there yesterday and attacked that ditch. And um, I think we won, but I'm not positive. <laughs> we cleaned that ditch, and I'm telling you, son, it's me and Brother Daryl and Brother Charlie, and we worked on that thing till I ran slap out of gas. There was a little more I wanted to do, but I didn't want to do it that bad. <laughs> Yeah, so brother uh, brother Tommy come by and he said, "What in the world are y'all doing?" So I told him. He said, uh, "You need to spray that thing." I said, "That's a good idea. That's what we was talking about doing, spraying it." He said, "You just y'all finish what y'all doing." He said, "I'll take care of the spraying." And I said, "You got a you got a deal there. We'll we'll finish it up. And you come spray it. So you got the water flowing in the right direction now." Brother Richard, how are you? Good to see you. We're trying to get ready to pond. Well, what happened was the pond, with all the rain we've had, and we've uh, we've allowed the ditch to to go unmaintained for a while. So the overflow of the pond goes into what they call a weir, but it's a, it's a, just a ditch, and then flows out to this other ditch that goes out to the city ditch. And there you go. Well, it had gotten so kind of overgrown that the it would flow, but it flowed slowly through the weeds and the grass and the mud and all of that, and it and uh, so the the pump is pumping a three inch pipe at full volume all the time, so it would it would fill up the little valley area that we got the weir area. It would fill it up so much that it would go back in the overflow. There's a there's a little ditch that you concrete ditch that they made us pour out of the pond that if the pond filled up so fast that the pump couldn't keep up, that it would flow out that concrete ditch. Well, it started coming back in. So it was swimming out of the pond through the pipe and back into the pond through our concrete ditch. And so we we was pumping in circles pretty much. And so we got out there and we had to clean it out. And, um, and uh, boy, I tell you what, yesterday wasn't near as mild as it was today. And it was jumping on us. But I'm so glad to have it over. Hey, Brother David, good to see you. And Brother Daniel there. Good to good to see you, Doctor. And Brother Robbie, David Capstro is uh, good morning, everyone. And then um, so is Brother Bob, Robbie Burton. He's saying good morning, everybody. Guys, send your uh, prayer request in. You guys have prayer requests this morning? I do. Yes, ma'am. Mm. So he's trying to make a decision between him, himself and 
his brothers, whether to put him in a nursing home, which they don't want to do, or, you know, have somebody to do private sitting. So he just really needs guidance, please. Okay. Did you say port? Hoyt. 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 Oh, I'm sorry. I heard a P at the beginning for something. Hoyt Sawyer. You know him if you see him because he comes to the scenes. Yeah, he comes to the scenes. Him and his wife, Robin. <clears throat> okay. Anyone else? Um, Holly has been having some stomach issues. Um, they're they're thinking it has something to do with her band, uh, but they're not sure, and they are taking forever to figure it out. Um, but she's been sick. And okay. So uh, Holly Silcox for stomach yeah. problems. Anybody else? Yeah, I remember me real buddy. My sugar got pretty high this morning, and I had a rough night with my legs and my back last night. For uh, sugar and legs. Back because it's all connected with my back. Yeah, backbone connected to. Mm -hmm. <laughs> neck bone, neck bone I got you. <laughs> Everybody, I figured out the Facebook Live thing. If you're doing it from a desktop, you can share your screen. Not well, that. I haven't ever figured out how to do it on the desktop. So, uh, on my laptop, yeah. I have a yeah on one on this one, yeah. Mm -hmm. But uh, I just can't figure out how to get in there. It wants me to go through some uh, other program called it's not Publisher, but it's something like that. Pub, it, it, it was it's weird. Win, it's probably the Windows based. Yeah, it, it is. Yeah. It is. Anybody else? Miss Billy. Uh, you still swollen? Yeah, not as much as last night. Good. Last night, my legs. And, um, yeah. Yes, ma'am? Mark is still recovering from all his doctor's appointments. Okay. <laughs> you wish Mark Couch. Somebody else did. Let's see, Billy. Recovery. Recovery. Uh -huh. uh, can you, uh, yes, yes. Brother David Capstraw says continue to pray for police officers and first responders. So, uh, absolutely. For the police and first responders. All right. Uh, anything else? Brother Waters and Brother Yeah, all of our our normals, right? Always our uh, normal prayers. Waters and these, um, for sure. Okay. Well, let's go to prayer. Yeah, brother, brother, I remember Brother A.L. Sweat. Uh -huh. They're only expecting him another month or so to live. With his, mm. uh, I believe it's his kidneys or his, anyway, his cancer. That man's been through a lot in his life, hasn't he? Yes, sir. And also remember his daughter. They've had to go back and do surgery on her leg, and they're talking possibility she may lose it. Her name's Connie Powers. For her leg. Yes, sir. Okay. All right. Well, let's pray. Um, Father, as we bow before you, I am so grateful for the opportunity that we have to come and share uh, today out of your word and about your word. And I thank God that, um, that we have that great privilege. I want to ask today, Lord, that you hear our request of prayer as uh, we know that there's not a greater power uh, that a Christian has than the ability to reach the throne of God. Your word tells us that the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. But we believe and we know, God, that you hear when we pray. Lord, help us to not doubt that. 
Help us not to think that we're just going through motions or speaking vain words into an empty space, but Lord, that we are conversing, we are communing with the God of heaven. And Lord, that you are have opened up audience unto us as the king of the universe to allow us to enter in to the very throne room of God. And Lord, we present our petitions, not um, flippantly, but Lord, concerned and sincerely, we bring to you today these requests of prayer. We There's a Hoyt Sawyer's dad. We pray, God, for him as they have some decisions that they must make in that family. We pray they make the right decisions, not based on their own comfort or their convenience, but based on what is right for dad. I pray to Heavenly Father, you'd be with Miss Holly Silcox and the stomach problems that she's having, whatever has caused them. It doesn't matter what causes the problem. What, is, what Lord, what the issue is, is that uh, they, they must be met. They must be discovered and then fixed. I pray for Miss Becky as she is constantly battling her uh, sugar diabetes and Lord constantly having the numbers to rise uh, way beyond where they should be. I pray God that you'd be with her as she battles that and tries to get that under control. And both the struggle that she has with her back and her legs um, of constantly uh, giving her pain and, and uh, not wanting to work properly. I pray for my mom, Miss Billy, and uh, the uh, retaining of fluid that has seemed to become a, an issue more recently than before. Since she's gotten her pacemaker put in, um, it seems like this has uh, been a start to that. And, and now, uh, Lord, I pray, God, that you would um, uh, guide and lead and bless that she might be able to uh, figure out what that problem is that some of the doctors might be able to tell her or, or whatever's going on that that issue can be resolved. Lord, I pray, Lord, for her to be able to be um, able to get around well and not have to deal with such um, um, unusual swelling. I pray, Lord, for um, Brother Mark as he has uh, had so many um, interactions with his doctors lately with both his eyes and then uh, the stuff on his face. And I pray, God, that you would just continue to bless him as, as uh, he's recovering from all of those things. I know sometimes it must seem like that this, uh, that's all we do sometimes is going from doctor to doctor. I pray, God, that you'd bless him with uh, not only physical recovery, but, Lord, I pray, God, you'd keep, keep his spirits raised, uh, raised up and keep him encouraged because I know it can be discouraging sometimes when, we're, when our physical um, seems like it, uh, when our physical bodies begin to give us a lot of issue, it seems like it can cause us to go into a spiritual slump if we're not careful. And I pray, God, that you would help uh, keep him lifted up there. For our society, for our country, uh, for our police officers, our first responders, God, I'm praying for them. I'm praying, Lord, that you'd keep them strong. I pray, God, that, that the good ones won't get discouraged and quit. I pray, God, they'll hang in there and that this country, God, by the, by the uh, guidance of a holy God, will find their minds again and will come back to reasonableness. Uh, so, Lord, please help as we're going through a very, um, as scriptures call it, I think a very perilous time. I pray, Lord, for uh, Brother Waters and Sister Waters, and Brother Richard and Miss Pat. Uh, I pray, God, you keep your hand upon those folks as they're, they got a lot of issues going on in their life right now. And I pray, God, that you'd be with them. For Brother Sweat and um, the cancer that he's battling, and it seems like he's come close to the end of his life, I pray, God, that you would just continue to uh, bless him and let him, let him trans, uh, transfer out of this life with as much grace as he lived in this life. We saw all the blessings that you, um, you brought into his life and how you raised him up and all the miracles that he saw. I pray, God, that his passing will be just as impactful on the lives of those around him. May folks come to know Jesus through uh, Brother Sweat's um, final days. I also ask uh, your blessings upon his daughter as she's got some issues with her leg. Uh, Miss Connie, I pray God that you would bless her, help them to be able to figure out how that she might not have to lose that leg. We thank you for all of that. I wanna thank you for all that are watching today and all that are in this room today. 
Lord, I'm aware that the news is still telling us that the COVID is still uh, very much with us and we still have to be um, very uh, cautious and uh, not just uh, throw everything out, but but uh, move carefully and, and be reasonable about all that we do. And I pray God should help us to be guided in that. Protect us. Uh, I know that COVID can't do anything that you do not allow. So I pray God you keep your hand upon us as we try to do the best we can. We give you glory and honor. We give you praise for all things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm. All right. Good morning, Miss Deidre. Good to see you joined in with us also. And I um, thought I saw Brother Wade. Yeah, Brother Wade's in. So good to have you guys with us today. Okay. All right. Uh, now, let me see if I can go find uh, not that one. I want to look at the uh, chart. That is called the Book of the Revelation. And that's Rosh Honor. And, oh boy, look at how I am something else. I scare myself sometimes. I think if I hit that again, it goes, no, it gets bigger. All right, look at there. Okay, so we are, um, is that going to be good enough? That's almost too much. Can y'all read that? Is that readable to y'all? Yeah. Okay, good deal. Because what I wanted to be able to make sure you could see all, all of this up here and the part that's down here. So, um, and if I blew it up any more than that. And I know you guys at home are going to be a little bit in a disadvantage because we're going to be talking about this... Uh, this thing that I never did figure out how to show y'all. This is a um, Charles Larkin. You might be able to surf it up. I know you can. This guy's phenomenal. He's everywhere. Uh, Clarence Larkin. He is all over the internet. If you uh, Google up um, a search on him and his charts, we're looking at the one called the Book of the Revelation. Can you see that? Yeah, the Book of the Revelation. I can't see y'all seeing it. Um, but uh, we're going to be talking about the, just the first part right here because we went through the seven churches and the letters written to the seven churches, and then we're going to talk about today um, the little gap that comes between chapters 3 and 4. She says it's backwards. When I hold it up there, it comes yeah, up backwards. Image. Oh, image. I bet that confuses your brain bad, don't it? Uh huh. Thing, yeah. You were talking about something on your wall. And it was backwards. It up, but it was backwards. Oh my goodness! Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know that. I'm sorry, Miss Miss Deidre. Thank you for telling me that. I didn't know it comes out backwards. They said it's a thing called mirror image. So if you want to see it frontwards, you got to see it in a mirror. So you got to hold a mirror up. <laughs> <laughs> um. <laughs> yeah. So we're looking at it about four. Never mind. Um, look it up on the internet. It's uh, Clarence Larkin and the book of the Revelation. It's chart number two, he calls it. Um, but anyway, what I want to talk with these folks about today and with those of you that can kind of maybe partway follow along, we've went through chapters one, two, and three in the Revelation. Chapter number one, Jesus told us that it is the revelation of Jesus Christ. And we saw him in all of his splendor and his glory. We see the image of the hair like wool, the eyes like fire, feet burned in a, uh, like if burned in a furnace. They're like brass. We hear the voice of many, sounds like the many waters and thundering of many waters. Um, I mean, we see this impressive figure of Jesus Christ, and he's revealing himself to John uh, in that way, and which is kind of the first time that I think maybe John gets a glimpse of the fact that he, we're not just talking about someone who is a prophet. We're not talking about someone who is maybe even just the son of God in the sense that he's been anointed, but we're talking about he is the almighty. And Jesus mentions several times in chapter one that I am he that was and is and is forevermore the almighty. 
And so with that being stated, the Revel book of the Revelation is not about prophecy. It's about revelation. It's about the revealing of who Jesus is to the church. So naturally, after he introduces himself in chapter number one, the next thing is, <laughs> when I talk about things being backwards, David said he thought it was just him. <laughs> um, whenever um, we, we see him introduce himself in chapter number one, the natural thing then is that he's going to uh, bring a message to his church. And so we, we see that he tells John to write these things, and he's writing to the seven churches that are in Asia. And we went through each letter, and each one of them, Jesus introduces himself. He um, then gives uh, accommodations to the church and correction to the church and ends every one of them up with the same invitation. He that has an ear to hear, let him hear. Hey, Miss Janet and Miss Grace, good to see y'all. So anyway, he's, he's, he's making sure that he's introducing himself as the Almighty God, which in chapter 1 in this, this figure that, they, that John saw of these feet like burned in a furnace of brass and, and uh, eyes like fire, hair like wool, and a voice that just shook everything, um, in, in, in such a fierce and awful picture, we see in the letters his compassion and his love and his tenderness. And he says, after everything, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And come, let me, let me envelop you. So we walk through the seven churches that we told you guys not only represented seven literal churches that were existent in that day, but also were are chronologically and historically representative of, of the church age as we've passed down from Pentecost to today, that the idea that um, we have the church goes through stages and that uh, so church number seven, Laodicea, um, we read the description just a couple of weeks ago of Laodicea and the charge that Jesus had against that church and the idea that it is a lukewarm church, neither hot nor cold, um, but is uh, just like a paper tiger. It is going through the motions. It, um, it's, it claims to be holy and righteous and yet is empty and has no power. Um, um, taking on the form of godliness but denying the power thereof. Not having fire. Uh, we, we don't, we're not denying him, but we're not living in the fullness of his power. We're content and settled, and satisfied, and rocked into complacency in the middle of it all, which we said is the worst thing that can happen whatsoever. If somebody is complacent and uncaring, if somebody is down and cast out and they know they're wretched, at least they have a chance to turn things around. They know they have a need. And if and uh, if somebody is on fire, we know that's wonderful. But if somebody is uncaring and thinks they're okay, you're in real problem. And that's where our church is today. That's why you can preach a message till you turn blue in the face and fall flat on the floor dead, and 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 calling people to repentance, and they'll sit there and look at you like that was a good message. I enjoyed that, and not be moved to repentance. That, and that's if I see any problem with our church today is our church is in a place where it's not moved to repentance. They may be moved. They may be emotionally stirred. They may even be appreciative and, and holding to some types of standards, but they're not moved to the place of repentance. Everybody comes in and wants to go out just as they came in. No changes. Don't rock the boat. Don't, don't change nothing. Let me stay where I am. I'm comfortable. And that's the problem that we have in the church today. So, Brother Wade, God bless you, brother. The man went and found that chart and put it up there. Uh, that looks like him. That's it, brother. Thank you. Um, Miss Ethel, good to see you. And then my honey just joined in. Good morning, darling. So, um, 
Brother Wade, I don't, um, that's the one. I don't know if that helps anybody else unless they can click on that, but then they'll probably lose us. I don't know, but um, that is the one. Jessica said y'all can do it, but there is a way to do it. <laughs> we need <I'm>, a class. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Bible Bible study ought to be sometimes uh, technical training first, right? So, starting with me. All right. Uh, so anyway, so that was uh, that's chapters one, two, and three. Because two and three was the seven letters, and we ended up at uh, Laodicea which we said represents the church age that we're in right now. Uh, that's the attitude of the church. And then the, at the end of chapter 3, uh, we, we're starting to go in now into chapter number 4. And before we made that transition, I wanted to show you on this chart, that because uh, a lot of folks uh, understand better when they can see things, um, visual aids. Uh, there is a transition that is made here that is pretty obvious. Um, that um, Jesus actually said uh, that in this thing that he was writing to the church, you, you have the things that were, the things that are, and the things that are to come. And so we, we're transitioning now from the things that are to the things that are to come. We're about to start talking about the age that is beyond our Laodicean church age, the things that come next. And uh, so with that, if you look at your chart, uh, if you need to, you can look up at the screen or whatever. But um, we had here, this was the Laodicean church. Uh, it's the lukewarm church. And uh, down below it, you see the, uh, uh, here's kind of the uh, earth timeline. The earth timeline. This is the revelational timeline. This is the heavenly timeline. And then down below is the world beneath us timeline. So um, here we have, this was the church age. And, um, and we have that right about this time at the end of the Laodicean church age, we have the rapture or the catching away of the church. As you can see right there, going up to meet at the judgment seat of Christ that'll take place over that seven year period that we know as the tribulation period. So that's, that'll be the start of that. So that's where we are right now. We're right here. If, the, if this is, as the picture's here, this is the rapture zone right here. We're living right here in the end part of this seventh period. And I don't know if that does anything for you or not, but it reminds me of how precious the time is. Every day. Every day. Uh, that any moment now, Richard, that, that the Lord could come and take us home. And, um, okay, Brother Wade said if you're on a computer, you can look at that. So you guys, see if y'all can figure that out. So any day now, the Lord Jesus Christ could come back as he describes in other scriptures on the cloud with the trump and the shout and the dead in Christ, those that have died and been laid in the grave and their souls have went on. Their bodies will come out transformed and we that are alive and remain will be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye and we'll be caught up together with him in the clouds and uh, that's where we'll ever be was with him forevermore. That's the next event. When you look at this, this tube right here that is kind of suctioning up the saints out of the church age, when you look at that, you got to recognize that is just about to take place. We're on the edge of that. Now, when I say that, I don't know if it's moments away, hours away, days, months. I don't know. But I know that timeline speaking, there's nothing else between us and it except the mercy and the grace of God for those who will come in. That's the only thing I can give you. The only thing that's waiting, the only thing that's lingering is the mercy and the patience and the grace of God for whosoever will to come. We talked about whosoever will on Sunday night with the water of life freely. So he's waiting on anybody who will come. Isn't it amazing? The whole message is, also, is always about whosoever will, let him come. 
Uh, Jesus uh, in John 3 and 16 tells us that God sent his son to this world so that whosoever would believe upon him might be saved. He tells us at the end of the book of Revelation, um, whosoever will, let him come and drink of the water of life freely. He is still extending that invitation. I'm talking about to the to the twelfth hour, to the to the end of the time of grace. He is still extending that mercy and that grace, and he's saying, "Won't you come? Won't you come?" So the rapture is not a threat. That's a promise. The rapture is not a threat. It's a promise. It's a promise he made when he went away. John 14 tells us. Jesus said, if I go away, I'll come again. So it's a, it's a promise that's been made. He's not trying to threaten the world to say, I'm going to come and snatch everybody out of here. And then what you're going to do? That's not the purpose of the rapture. It is a promise. It's a fulfillment of the fact that whosoever will come into this ark of safety I'm going to come back and snatch you out of here before the wrath of God falls on those who reject the payment for their sin. You, you may be wondering, why is it that a holy and a loving God would pour out wrath on human beings who are on this earth? Well, he first of all provided a way of escape for them. He built an ark. The Jesus Christ, through the shed blood of Jesus Christ, he built an ark of safety. We talked about Noah just a sermon or two ago. And so here's this ark of safety. And what does he do? He invites all to come in. Most reject and say, no, thank you. I'm good on my own. Well, if you come inside, you won't have to face the wrath of God. You will be covered. You'll be protected, shielded. You'll, you'll miss the wrath. No, thank you. I got this. And so because they choose to reject and they miss the covering and the protection, one day the wrath has got to come upon them. The, the question is why? Because sin must be paid for. Well, sin also separates us from God. If you think about the, garden, the fall in the garden. Yes. Um, Adam hid from God, right? Adam hid himself from God and cover, covered himself. And then we find that God comes searching for Adam, right? So even though sin separates us from God, like you just said, the deal is, is that God doesn't just settle for that. God comes seeking to restore you back to that place of shelter and safety. And so he calls and he calls and he calls. And the thing that I said to you earlier about the church age today is, is that there is no seeming urgency for anybody to want to repent and change. And only reason I can give to that is that everybody is comfortable. They're complacent. They're content where they are because they think they're good enough. Well, if you look at our society, it's preaching that we're enough. It's telling us that, okay, it's okay for us to go out and do this, this, and this, but also worship on Sunday morning and only enter the doors on a Sunday of a church on a Sunday morning. Or not. Or not. Or not. You can come to church on Sunday or not because the church is not what matters. It's, yeah. it's about whether you just love everybody and you accept everybody. You do good, do no harm to people. And that's why we're supposed to open up to every type of lifestyle and every type of debauchery that comes down the line, no matter what the Bible says about it. We have to accept it if people say that's what they are and what God has led them to be or created them to be. Oh, then it must be okay, no matter what the scripture says. And so if you don't do that somehow, you're narrow-minded. And, uh, and, but, but it's caused us to become everybody's complacent. Everybody's satisfied right where I am. I don't have to change. And that's what repentance is all about is change. So it doesn't matter to me if you're born uh, the, the, the son of a pastor, preacher, priest, um, an angel sent down from God practically. You're just, I mean, you're just in the most holy position possible. You must be born again. You re you're required that your sin be paid for one way or another. Brother TJ. That takes us back to the original thing. We must believe, we must receive, and yep. then we will serve. Those three things that they have been since the beginning of time, and they will be at the end of time. Believe, receive, and serve. That scripture that you brought out the other night, mm -hmm. that word take, 
that four letter word, take, it was the same as receive. You must take it. You must receive it and everything. And this is something that is missing in our churches today because people believe, they, they believe, but they don't receive. They don't take what God has done for them and what he, you know, it is finished, it is done, it is, but they don't receive it. Therefore, when they don't receive it, they don't receive the free gift of salvation, the Holy Spirit that comes and lives in them, they won't serve. Okay? It's the same way with That's right. coming, you know, these people that say they're rich, they say they're all this, but the problem is, is that they come to the Sunday morning service, but they won't come to the Sunday night, to the Wednesday, because they got other important things to do. They got other things. They are not receiving the fullness sure. of what God gave for them. Yep. In, in the easiest of atmospheres and in the least thing that you could do, uh, Brother TJ is just talking about the lack of church attendance, and I know that may be offensive to some of you, but I want to share something with you. That's the very simplest and least, smallest commitment that you can make to God. Amen. I mean, you, you attend church, come to a service for an hour, three times a week, right? And, and most folks are going like, well, I just can't do all... If you can't give that, then what makes you think that you're really giving anything greater than that? And that I, I don't don't get mad at me. I'm just saying the idea of the very least commitment possible is our is our attendance, um, maybe uh, the giving of our our uh, finances as we've been blessed by God. And when folks can't do those things, and yet they think, hey, I you know. I love the Lord. I'm, I'm, I'm serving God. And I, I don't know how you can equate that. You're, you're just blinded to the fact that you're not even willing to give a percentage of your time or a percentage of your wealth or a percentage of your talents or your gifts like he asked us to do. And if you're not willing to give that, then how in the world do you think that you're giving the other? I just, that's beyond me. Um, it's, it's a, it's a self-deception in my mind. Uh, we we lie to ourselves. We tell ourselves that we're we're better than what we are. I said this past Sunday. I think it was maybe Sunday night. If you want to know what you really are like, you need to ask somebody that's close to you and honest. <laughs> <laughs> right? Hold to yourself as a little child and get back in God's word and read it. That way you're not turning and twisting trying to change something, cover up something you know is wrong in the first place. Bonnie, you're spot on with that. The idea that if we want to we want to see where we really stand, Bonnie said get back into God's Word. The idea is, is that when we read the Word of God, it gives us the picture of where we're supposed to be, and we can see the reflection of who we really are, and we see that we don't measure up to that. Um, the book of James talks about that uh, the Word of God is like a mirror. We see ourselves in that reflection, but when we go away, uh, we forget what manner of man we are. And uh, so it's it's because uh, without that constant interaction with God's word and his spirit reminding us of who we are, man, we, we lose it. We, we begin to think that we're better. Our mind conjures up how wonderful we are because of the things that we think matter, you know. And so um, we hear other people tell us how good we are or, or we're comparing ourselves to those around us. That's I, I, That used to be my favorite thing to do. I used to love to just compare my. As long as I'm doing better than you guys, I must be right there. I am Johnny on the spot. So, I, you know, I just all I wanted to do was make sure I'm better than the next guy around. And I don't know how I measured that, but I, it was in my mind I was thinking, as long as I'm better than the person next to me, I'm okay. We were taught in school. Yeah. At, well, you're right about that, brother. We're taught in school they that way. That's wrong. And I and I honestly taking Christ out of church, out of school. Yep. So we come to church, we don't have Christ in the church either. You're exactly right. We're taught not to need it. Take, that's exactly right. Depend on ourselves, right? Depending on yourself. So uh yes. Yeah, so, like what TJ says. Yep. Believe, receive, and serve. And do. That's right. And serve. So here I ended up um I ended up falling to uh, my own um uh, my own inadequacies my own sin, my own lust and desires because 
I was focused on something other than God's word for my righteousness. Right. And so, man, you, you can really drift a long way away. You know, that that's we're going on a little tangent, so y'all stay with us for a second. Uh, remember King David, mm-hmm. his sin with Bathsheba. Yeah. That doesn't astound me too bad. What astounds me is a couple of years later, maybe up to a couple of years later, um, we have Nathan the prophet that comes before David. And he says, I, I, I need to have audience with you, can I talk? So he, he's got to go through some channels to get a chance to talk to, to the king. So he finally gets his day to go speak with the king. And he comes in and he tells the story about a rich man that stole a poor man's little ewe lamb, that he, the only lamb he had that he raised up from a baby. When he had plenty of sheep, he, could, he stole this one man's lamb, killed the guy, and then took that lamb and cooked it up and served it to feed some of his friends he had come in from out of town. How David couldn't recognize that it was. And how David couldn't recognize it. That's where I'm headed for, brother. And the idea that Nathan went through that whole thing and David was enraged, remember? Mm-hmm. he I can almost see him throwing things and saying, the guy that did that shall surely pay fourfold, you know, we're going to burn his house and we're going to kill him and, you know, <laughs> I mean, he, and, and Nathan just sitting there listening to the rage and the, and the condemnation that David has on this guy. And when he finally takes a breath, Nathan says, Thou art the man. Woo! What astounds me is, is that we can drift so far and not be aware that we've drifted so far. How did David not know he had sinned with God? Well, he knew it, I think, but he may have covered it or salved it over, um, soothed it somehow, and then eventually you do that enough, you kind of forget about it. And as you press on and you go on in time, you, you think, you, and you, when you see something in others, you go like, hur, hur, you're doing this and you're doing that, and we're pointing fingers and throwing rocks. and. We're, and it, it keeps the focus off of me, TJ. I don't want nobody looking into the inner parts of me. As long as I can keep pointing at you and I can keep throwing stones at you, then nobody's going to pay attention to the fact that, that I'm not where I am, including me. I'm not going to be aware of that. And so whenever Nathan tries to point it out, David is quick to ready to condemn this man to death, to repentance to death. And then Nathan says, you're the one I'm talking about. And uh, I I think that had to be like somebody just slapping his head so hard, it went all the way around and came back to the front and he went like, oh my. Oh my. After he realized it, we get Psalm 51 where he's repentant and have a contrite heart. Right. Exactly right. Psalm 51 comes right after that when we see the picture of his repentance. Wait a minute. A man can commit murder and adultery and lie and cover it up. That's right. Amen. And then he can repent and get forgiveness. And still be called a man after God's own heart. And still be a man after God's own heart. Can he still, he can still have this. He says, take not the Holy Spirit from me. He's, God's always calling for repentance. He that has an ear, let him hear. Come, come and drink. Take of the water of life freely. I think it's a marvelous thing. That's what God has always wanted to do. We're on the edge. I blew this up a little bit on our screen as I'm looking at down uh, on what I told you was the earth level here, the, the scale of what's taking place on the earth. And uh, looking here, you see the translation of the saints. This is the rapture, taking the catching the ones that are alive and the ones that have passed on. You see also the second tube here that is bringing up those um, that had uh, passed during the end of the tribulation period, uh, those that had died in Old Testament times, and any that died during this time forward are taken up here in this area right here. Okay, that, that's so that they can be counted in the number of the folks that stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Okay? And in that particular period, that's where all of the saved, all of those who have trusted in the shed blood of Jesus Christ, 
are, are taken into account for the deeds done in the flesh so that they might receive or suffer the loss of rewards. Okay. So that's the period of time that we're at. Any questions about this? That's pretty much all I wanted you to see about that before we move into chapter four. Uh, this particular piece of paper, the book of the Revelation, is kind of an overlay of what the book talks about in its order and then tries to connect where those things might take place because what you're going to see as we continue our study now in the future events, you're going to find that sometimes that you read about something and then it seems like we go backwards in the next chapter. And then you'll go back uh, to, to the future again in this chapter and then it seems like the next chapter goes backwards again. And it's because that, um, uh, that the Lord is trying to reveal to us some things that are happening, but you can't tell you everything all at one time. So he has to tell you this that's happening here, maybe on earth, and this is happening in heaven. And then it seems like you go backwards again. And so it's, it's, it can be confusing to you. This, to me, helps me to put things in a more linear perspective of the fact that I, I, re, I need to realize that when I'm reading, some of these things are happening at the same time. Some things in heaven, some things on earth, some things beneath the earth, all at the same time, so that I can be aware that uh, that and not be so confused about going like, I thought that already happened. I read about that last week. Well, the reason that it's coming up again here is because you, there was a, what do they call it, a parenthetical chapter that came in and kind of paused everything and said, hey, by the way, let me tell you this. And that's what happened. Okay, you guys all good? Before we go to four, mm -hmm. um, you know, talking about the rapture and everything and how you just talked about that story with David. Right. Um, I think it's important for all of us to realize that, um, you know, and I, I know that with myself, um, you know, because I'm constantly, you're, you're helping me to, uh, uh, to recognize that whenever I'd done something or said something and how that I needed to reshape it or, or do something or whatever. And that's exactly what I felt like about the story of David, that when Nathan did this, David could have reacted a whole different way. And instead, David, he accepted this, and he, re he, he was remorseful, and he repented, and he, uh, he was pliable, as you like to tell me a lot of times about being pliable, That's about right. being able to accept the co constructive criticism, criticism and everything. And that's how you grow. That's how you grow spiritually. And I believe that that, that story of David was what did it for me because I remembered that story the very first time that you ever, you, me and you in your office called me in and I went, I was going to get a butt to it. <laughs> and, but it was about a constructive criticism sure. and everything else and I remembered that story daily. Hey, brother David. And, and and everything. And so I think it's important for us to really, really look at that because that's what made him a, a man after God so much. That's exactly what I was going to say. I, that That's what makes him, his willingness to repent. How many in here are always right? <laughs> Besides me. I mean, I have moments when I feel like I'm always right. Don't we all? <laughs> Don't we all? Uh, and, and that's the thing. There's... I, and I guarantee you, most of the arguments that I have with my wife, now I don't know if she's still watching or not, but if she is, <laughs> you don't have to comment on this, baby. Um, exactly. <laughs> but in those arguments, she'll straighten me out later. Um, this is another one of them times, right? In those arguments, I, I found myself more in past times than in late, later times because God's really done a work in, in me and, and our relationship, my wife also. But um, I remember just hanging on to something and just dogmatically arguing something for no apparent reason. It wasn't going to make a difference in the world except that I wanted to be right. I wanted to show her that I remembered it correctly and she remembered it wrong. 
And, and I can't figure out for the life of me what difference that made. Except for the right. fact that we are, are so um, resistant to the idea of having any rebuke whatsoever. Uh, th that's what I think is in this in this entitled world that we live in today. That that the, this younger generation, in particular, no offense, is they don't want to be told not even a little bit that what they're doing is wrong. And if you can't ever be corrected, like you were talking about, if you can't ever be corrected, you will never find the right path. You will never get the right answers. You will go on thinking that all you do is okay. I remember we we were uh, coaching Little League Baseball, and we started with, uh, uh, my wife said, be careful, I'm listening. <laughs> I hope I did okay. Um, when we were coaching Little League Baseball and uh, T-ballers, T-ballers would get up there, and, and, and bless God, it didn't matter what they did. Their mamas and daddies were screaming and hollering at them, and then they come off and they would tell them, you're the best one, you did right. Everybody else on that team is sorry, you're the best one. And and, and I, I know what they were trying to do, trying to lift their kid up. But I don't think, I, I've, I've met some of them since then, they're 30 and 40 now. It's psychologically and emotionally damaging to do that. Yeah, and I think the mamas and daddies still telling them the same thing. And it's, it's, the, it's, the, it's, the, it's not even caring or loving to treat someone that way, um, man, you got to be able, as God does to us in his love, he approaches us, and sometimes it's through others, like Brother TJ talked about, that that's my responsibility toward him and any one of you, by the way. Um, and that was Nathan's responsibility to the king. And uh, so this is the second time this person's tried to call, so let me see what's going on. Hello? No, I did not. No, ma'am, I didn't call. All right, dear. All right, baby. All right, Lord, what's wrong with you to pray for me? <laughs> All right, dear. Bye bye. Miss Peggy, she thought I called her for some reason. All right. Um. Talk about those parents. Or you still thought their kids was right. Right. They still think, yeah, they, their kid didn't do nothing wrong. They were just so. <laughs> so the 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 thing I'm just trying to get across there is the idea we need, uh, we have to humble ourselves. We have to humble ourselves and recognize that that God, I am, I'm a fallible, um, imperfect, uh, sin tendent. Uh, what, what do you call that uh, when you have a propensity? Uh, yeah, I have a propensity towards sin. Most of us don't like to admit that. I, I told somebody one time, they said, you know, I, I don't know why in the world I keep doing this. I said, it's because you love it. And they said, no, I don't. I said, yes, you do. No, I don't. And there was a big argument that ensued. Well, they, that's back to that, what Paul talked about in Romans about the spirit versus the flesh. That's exactly right. So the idea, the reason that you sin is because you love sin. I am that I am. Yeah. Instead of humming, I was saying, right. saying explain it to me. Tell me what you see. How Amen. And get right on this. Amen. And, and Miss Jessica mentioned uh, Paul out of the book of Romans, chapter number seven. He actually just says this, oh, wretched man that I am. What? He's the Apostle Paul. I mean, he's, he's writing the book to, uh, to the Romans. I mean, it's, we're, the Apostle Paul is saying that, that whenever I try to do good, I find that evil is always present with me. There's this struggle inside of me. And, I, and without the walking in the Spirit of God, I find that I am, I am uh, nothing more than a sinner saved by grace. And so the idea that we get to a place where we think that we can't be told anything, and that's why I stay on top of these preachers so much because you can be lifted up in your own mind when you start receiving um, anointings and appointments and commissions 
to go into ministry and do things, you can start thinking, well, God must think I'm pretty good because he's chose me to go do all this stuff. And so you, you begin to think that you're supposed to be the person that's got all the answers. I've, I've been there. I know. Uh, you, you're, you're the know-it-all, and if somebody comes to you and says, well, brother, what about this, that, and the other? You're supposed to have the answer. And so many times um, I finally discovered, thank God, he got through my thick skull, that, that I'm, it's okay for me to say, I don't know. If I don't know, I need to say, I don't, I don't know. Not to make up something or say, well, this is what I think about. It doesn't matter what I think about it. What does the Word of God have to say? So you need to be able to pull back and say, you know what? I'm not smart enough to know that. You know, I'll pray about it, see if the Lord give me something. But the idea of, of, of taking ourselves to the place that we humble ourselves before God and are willing to hear the voice of God correct us and guide us, that should be, oh, God help me. I'm on this tangent, so let me just stay with it. That should be the, the motive, um, the mood, the mode. That should be the mode that every individual comes to church with when we come into our Sunday school hour or our Bible study or our preaching service. We should come in saying, "There's, I have a need. I, I'm, I'm wide open because I need to learn something today. I need to learn. I'm not here to, to show myself and boast about who I am or, or let somebody see me and be blessed by me being here. That's not the thing. I need to be here so that I can receive from God because there's an emptiness in me in, in, in some area. I need to re, I need to be fed. And I, I guarantee you, God would dump the blessings every single time if we would come before him. And it wouldn't have to be just in services or Sunday school or Bible study. It could be in our own personal time of communion and intimacy with God right by yourself. And you come before God and you just have your... You just you just have yourself stretched out before him and say, Lord, I need to receive from you today. And Hallelujah. That's exactly right. We did a, a sermon not long ago, Bona, on um, the prayer of Jabez. And the very first thing that Jabez said was, Lord, that thou would bless me indeed. He didn't give any direction to God. He just said, whatever you got for me, I want it. I need it. I got to have it. I've been called a loser. Um, uh, Jabez meant uh, sorrow. He said, I've been called a man of sorrow, of disappointment all of my life. And I, all I want is your blessing. I need to be filled with whatever you've got. Whatever you got for me, I'm here. Fill me up. And, and then, you know, he went on from there. We talked about the other things. But my point is, is that he wasn't trying to direct God or instruct God. He was waiting for directions and instructions from God. Amen. And boy, wouldn't we be better off if we did that instead of trying to give, tell God how to do things. You know, Brother Buddy, it's, yeah. uh, when, when we're sitting in church or in, in, in our Bible or wherever and we realize that this message or this song or whatever it is that moved us, that that is the Spirit moving in us, telling us this message is for you. And if it is for you, then why don't you get up and repent? You know, if you did wrong, then you need to get up and repent. Right. Right then. Not yep. just sit there and later on when church is done, go out and say, well, that message was just for me. And forget about it. You know, and, and think that there's no response or no responsibility. <clears throat> and uh, I've done that. I've done that so many times. Sure, I think a lot of us have. Or maybe all of us have at some point have heard and acknowledged and knew what was going on, but we did not respond. Remember, the end of every letter is let him that hath an ear to hear. Let him that hath an ear hear what the Spirit said. So the idea is that he wants us to respond. He, he wants us to hear it, and he wants us to respond to it. I think we don't realize that when, when different people talk about the moving of the Spirit, because of the Pentecostal move, they think they're supposed to get up and jump around screaming and hollering. Emotionalism, yeah. Maybe that's not what it means. Right. Maybe it means move. You know, the Lord's calling you. Now, I get a little carried away sometimes my own self, as you guys may have noticed a time or two. <laughs> and I love to jump and run and, and oh, holler and shout. 
but it should be because there's been something inside that has caused that to come outside. What happens, I think, too many times is there's those that are doing it on the outside only. And <clears> it, it's, that's right. It wasn't stirred by a revelation or a truth or a touch of God or something that is just bubbling up in them so much that they just can't handle it. it it's, it's something that, that, has, um, that they think would cause them to um, display that Pentecostal anointing. But if you really got that Pentecostal anointing, it's going to change who you are, align you up with God. And when that happens... Yeah, it may bubble out, and you don't you, know what you're doing. That's exactly right. It may explode like Mount St. Helens. You know what I'm saying? Move or bust. Amen. I want to go one. I want to go to our text. I know I do to too. Our, to our to <laughs> Revelations chapter four. Revelation chapter one four, two, right? verses one and two. That's okay, right. Okay, where he says, "Cometh up hither." Come on. He go. He tells us to cometh up hither. If you look at verse 2, the very next thing that it says is immediately I was in the Spirit. How about that? So when you feel like you have an inkling, Woo. don't wait for him to say, anybody that wants to come up here and pray or anything. Amen. That, 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 you're, 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 you were still preaching the other night. Yeah. And I'm sitting there and the Lord said, Get up. You think it's time? Yeah. <laughs> I've been there. And what was funny was when Debbie come back, she says, what what, 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 what did you do that you had to go up there and repent for? And I went, I went, I said, the Lord told me that while I was sitting over there. He goes, you know, there's a bunch of people sitting out there in that. What's wrong with him? Right now. What's wrong with him? <laughs> I said, you know why I was up there? I said, I was praising God and thanking God. I, she goes, you do that all the time. And I go, I said, I don't do enough. No. I fall so short. Yes, we That's never exactly know right. our action immediately. How it's going to affect the people that are sitting there that God has got there watching. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It may not be nothing we say, mm -hmm. but just our actions of be getting up and going to the altar. Absolutely. I may be opening the door for several people. Get up and we never know. Bonnie, you, you said a mouthful right there. And I, I, something I want to kind of just capitalize on a little bit if I can. The idea Bonnie said that we never know what we do and how it's going to affect those around us. And, of course, that is not the primary motive. Excuse me. That's not the primary motive behind doing anything. Mm -hmm. The primary motive behind doing something is to be obedient, to obey God. I need to be obedient to God, and I need to be obedient to God, as Brother TJ just said out of verse number 2. I need to be obedient immediately. I need to respond, and I need to respond now. I need to respond completely. Whatever he said, I need to give myself to it, and I need to give myself to it right now. Now, that immediately is going to uh, be effective in my own personal life and my relationship with Jesus Christ. And that's about as much as I'm in control of. That's about as much as my responsibility goes. But God can use that to affect so many people around us. So many other folks maybe will see that as Mona just talked about, and they too will be changed because that's the way God works. God's always working in 360 degrees. He's always working all around us at the same time, doing so many things at one time because he's God, he can do that. Me, I have to do like one thing at a time. I can't keep my mind on more than more than that. So if I'll just worry about being obedient in my own life and surrender to God, then God will get the glory as he moves through lives of others through what he may do in my life or how I may be surrendered to him. I don't know. But my point is to make sure that you're always obedient to God. If God moves on your heart to get out of your pew and go to that altar in the middle of the second song of the song service, Bless God, you need to get up and go to that altar and cry out to God right then and there. Right. Amen? Always, That's always open. Always open. That's what that means. They're always open. Altars are always open. In fact, Miss Carol, the, um, the thing that we need to recognize is it's not the preacher that gives the invitation. Come on. That's right. It's the Spirit of God that gives the invitation. And if he calls you, like I said, in the second... Second chorus of the first song. Bless God, hit the hit the altar. Don't say, well, after the service. I'll... It may be gone then. That's not when he called you. You must do what he says, as Brother TJ pointed out in verse 2, 
immediately when he says. Brother Charles Bennett. Yep. Friday night at a gospel scene. There you go. The Lord spoke to him and called him back unto him. They drawed him back to himself. That's right. Charles went up there and hid his own testimony. I still remember the time he told me that. He went up there, got down on his knees, and he and he cried out to God and he 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 poured his heart out. Not a soul with him. And right in the middle of the gospel scene. Yeah. And look at what and then immediately Immediately, he's going to Tennessee to work on a project <laughs> because God said, you're going to go. Just That's like exactly right. Me. Hallelujah. He didn't uh, know anybody from Adam. You know, he knew from, you know, previous years of seeing, but, you know, I said, if you feel like you need to go, go. Uh, <laughs> and and what a change. Adam? Yeah, what a change. That was his moment. And what happened, he was obedient and, immediate, and immediately when God called, and with that, there there was this uh, there was this move. There was this translation from where he was to where he is, which is kind of leads us into chapter number four. Anybody got anything before we go to four? Chapter four, chapter four, verse number one. It says uh, John says that after this. Now remember, it's after all of the letters that he had been um, scribing down. After this, I looked, and behold, a door was open. If I can remind you, back in chapter number 3, um, verse 20, uh, Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock, right? Yep. If any man will open. Uh, here it says, I looked, and behold, a door was opened. And the first voice which I heard was, as it were, a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither. And I will show thee things which must be hereafter. Some of the um, language in this verse reminds us of what we're told about the rapture. The voice like a trumpet, for example. The come up hither, the snatching away, uh, the taking out of here. A door opened up in heaven. Here's, here's the idea that we, we believe. I believe with all of my heart. I believe this totally. That we're going to get to see him. We're gonna whether I don't know if that's a literal vision or a spiritual vision, but when he comes down on the cloud, and the and the trumpet sounds and the shout is made, we see him. It's it's going to happen so quickly. I don't I don't know that we have time to actually look up physically, but we see him immediately. I think everything kind of pales in you know if we're in a a dungeon somewhere. I think we're spiritually transformed and can see right through everything. And we see him on the cloud immediately. And um, and we, we caught up with him in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. A lot of the language in this verse sounds like the language that we see in verses that reflect the rapture, the catching away of the church to us. So there's a lot of theologians. Um, Clarence Larkin did it with his chart that I've showed you, that this is the moment in, in time of the timeline that we believe that the rapture of the church takes place, that the return of Christ into the air, not to this earth, but into the air, takes place to catch away his bride. And uh, so a lot of folks are wondering when the rapture is going to take place, when's the time. Um, the, the placement of, we don't know the hour, we don't know the day, but the placement in the uh, arrangement of events falls at the end of the Laodicean church age and before the tribulation begins. Squeezed right in there. Yes, sir. Oh, I thought you had. All right, so with that being said, um, there was something that flew through my mind. must not have been very important because it flew out the other side. So let's keep on going. Bye-bye. Yes, um, ma'am. I know we believe that the, that the rapture will happen before the tribulation, but there are some that believe that happens halfway through the tribulation. Yes. That, do we know where that comes from? Or? There are there are those that believe that, uh, as Miss Jessica brought forth, and I would like to bring that out, that there's various thoughts um, on the uh, rapture. Uh, some believe that the rapture takes place, as we do, before the tribulation period. Some believe it takes place in the middle of the tribulation. And the reason for the middle, as she asked, is the first three and a half years are going to be years of relative peace or what we call pseudo-peace. 
It's when the Antichrist makes a peace treaty with Israel, um, but it's it's just he's just baiting them. He's just hooking them to draw them in. After three and a half years, he breaks that peace treaty, um, and that's when the real great part of the tribulation turns nasty when things really get for the last three and a half years. So some people believe that the church might be left here for the first three and a half years until the treaty is broken. And then some believe that the church has to go through the tribulation and will be raptured out at the end of it because of purging. They believe that that is how God will cleanse his church because the Bible says that it has no spot or no blemish. And he, they believe that through the, the, uh, the tribulation and the tortures and the torments and the trials that people have to go through if you're a believer in the tribulation, that that is how God purges his church out. He uh, takes the phonies away from the real. And that, that's because like you don't know, right? Yeah. And so once we're born again, we're covered with Christ's cloak, so cloak of righteousness. That's right. So we don't give any credence. I personally don't give any credence or, um, uh, or lend any feasibility to mid-tribulation or post-tribulation rapture. Um, the reason that I'm a pre-tribulation rapture guy is because Noah never felt one drop of rain. Uh, the Bible tells us that we're not called to wrath, uh, but we're called to righteousness and we're called to, to judgment. Uh, we're, we're, we're the guys that um, my sin has already had God's wrath poured out on it on the cross of Calvary. And you can't be judged and and condemned twice for the same crime. My sin's already been paid for. So I don't need the purging. I don't need the cleansing. I don't need the judgment or wrath poured out on my sin. It's already been taken care of. So therefore, I'm going to be, I'm going to miss that because Christ already paid for mine. So it's not fair to make him pay for it with his life, his blood, his stripes, the nails, and then turn around and make me pay for it also. I would have thought that the rapture was a, a turning point for the world to have a problem that needed one leader. And I thought that that's how the devil used that rapture event to convince people that he's the best guy for a job and come on in. I do believe that he will use that just as you, that's my personal belief once again. I do believe, Brother Mark said he believed that the rapture was a time that the Antichrist would use uh, to position himself as a one world leader because of all the confusion and the chaos. And I am in perfect agreement with that. That's just my personal opinion. How he comes into power <clears throat> is still up in the air. It's not described to us in scripture, except that this one thing, and that is that the rulers and the kingdoms of all this world, they give him, they give him the power. He doesn't have to take it. So there's so much chaos and there's so much uncertainty in the world at that time at, after the rapture that leaders are looking for somebody. And here this man who is able to call down fire from heaven, um, uh, Elon Musk kind of guy that maybe he's got satellites that shoots lasers down or something. I don't know. <laughs> we, I know we had different theories, but <clears throat> I always thought it would be this would, uh, Angelic would be the perfect example for that. Like the CDC head guy said, I can save all of us. Yep. Come, give me I've got the cure. Give, give me all the money you got for it, and I'll get the, the uh, antidote and all that stuff. Brother Mark, you you're you're exactly right, and I know, hello, I got chills all over you talking about because we we saw we saw a sampling over the last three months of how all the world will follow after the leadership. I'm when I say all the world, I know there's some dissenters, but primarily how complacent the majority is to give up their rights. What you said, yeah. that's exactly right, and we surrender it over to leadership like that. And we just, we put our trust and our confidence in them, and we're willing to give it all away, you know? And uh, this seemed to be like it was a trial run or something for the, for the, uh, uh, the, <laughs> the, the unveiling of the Antichrist. Bona? The mess we're going through right now. Yep. They're trying to pass a law that there'll be one world government. Right. And they're going to tell us what to do. Yep. I agree. 
I, I, I did a sermon not too long ago. You got to have the. There's going to be some kind of a. Well, they're looking to be able to trace you everywhere you go because of this. The more, the more that we look at this thing, and the more we look, you know, we realize that in chapter four, and like you said, yeah, in verse one and two. Here we go. We know that it's the. True believers. Yep. It's the ones, and we're that living have in chapter three, verses twenty. <laughs> that they have, they have, they have set it in stone. They have run their race. They're on the starting block, waiting for the gun to sound, and they're off and running. And so, free trivers. Yeah, we're the believers, the real ones. They're gone. We're in the blocks. Okay. Then we know that if we read on in the Revelation, as we will do. We find out that Eventually. we get to the two witnesses and the 144,000 that were sealed that will all, not a one of them, will be lost. Right. They will return to the Father. And we know that according to what Paul wrote in, Revel I mean in Romans chapter 11, I wish you not to be ignorant, brethren, that the Jewish people, that the Jews will be saved, those who will convert, they will be saved, and everything. And I believe that's what the 144,000 are doing. So there's your mid trevors Then you get to the end of the book of Revelations in chapter 19, and all the ones that did not take the mark of the beast, they did not, they got their heads cut off because they would not bow their knee to Baal or whatever you want to call it. There's your post, Trevors. The bottom line is, you better make sure you're on the first bus, man. Yeah, absolutely. Get on the first bus. Absolutely. Jesse, you had something? It, I forgot what it was. So it must have been important. <laughs> well, I have a question. If you can skip a revelation, I need to skip. You want to skip to? I got to skip to just a verse 4. I, I want to see what, what the 24 folks are in the uh, throne. I know it calls them elders, but who are these elders? Brother Mark is um, is trying to is trying to pull rank, and he um, he he wants to skip to verse number four just for um, to satisfy a question that's in his mind. It says, "Round the throne were four and twenty seats, and upon the seats he saw four and twenty elders sitting clothed in white raiment. They had um, their heads uh, on their heads crowns of gold." And his question is, who are the 24 elders, right? Yeah, yeah that's a great question. <laughs> we'll find out when we get 24 <laughs> guys to ask once you get it. That's a great question. <laughs> now, I, 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 with that being said, uh, there are um, a lot of speculation. There's, mm -hmm. there's plenty of people that have their answers. Um, but So I'll give, I'll give you some of those. Um, but I... What I don't want to do is I want to remind you that the book of the Revelation is not about future events. Mm -hmm. It's about the revelation of Jesus Christ. So some of the players and some of the um, uh, countries and events that take place um, that some people have already ascribed that this is Great Britain and this is the United States and here's Russia and here's Israel and this is the Muslims and uh, some people that have done that already uh, they just need to be real careful about that because the Bible doesn't actually say that. And so when we get there, uh, this may be a whole different ball game. Um, the four and 20 elders, some people say, some people, some people say that it's the representative of both the Old and the New Testament. Mm -hmm. 12 tribes and the 12 apostles. That's right. Uh, the 12 tribes and the 12 apostles. So we have... Uh, a representation of both um, the Old Testament being fulfilled in the New Testament and the, um, the Testament being revealed in the Old Testament. Exactly. So the New Testament being revealed in the Old. So the idea that, that they were really one. They weren't working against each other. It wasn't the law versus grace. It was the law leading us to grace. And so um, some people believe that that, that is the representation. Uh, these four and 20 elders, um, I don't know that they're literal people. 
I don't, gosh, you're probably going to hate me after this. But they they, they got to be literal people because they're at the talks I don't pray eternity. They praise God. Mm -hmm. They're like the, the permanent choir. All day, all night. They never stop. That's, they're, they're praising God. Right. So it must be the, the, the in place choir. I don't know. Well, when I say not, maybe not literal people, what I'm saying is I'm not going to, I don't, I'm not sure. This is me. I'm not sure that one of them is Moses, one of them is Abraham, one of them is Jacob, that type of thing. That's what I mean when I say literal people. I'm not sure that that's who it is as much as a representation of the fact that you have uh, these um, dispensational folks that are worshiping the Lord, and that's just he represents them as 24 elders. I don't know if that makes sense to you. Yeah, Whoever well, God of well, they, they had, they had to, when it talks about they laid their crowns, and they, that's what it gives to me, in my mind, they're a, a real entity. I mean, you can't put a, on a, on a piece of air, you can't put a helmet and, or, or a crown and wear it and then give it away. It doesn't exist. So. But you don't know that that's yeah. not also symbolic. Well, symbolic, that's why I said that's, that was the question. So uh, if, if, if the crown of gold's on their head is symbolic, um, then the people themselves can be representative. Well, I don't want to say symbolic. They can be representative of a, of, of a nation or of a group of people. Because um, when we talk about, you know, the Bible in the Old Testament, this the Lord just kind of popped this in my head, I think. Uh, in the Old Testament, sometimes God writes his books through the prophets to Jacob. That, and thou, Jacob, shall da 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 da. Is he talking to Jacob? Jacob's dead and gone a long time. He's talking to the nation of Israel. But Jacob is the representation of Israel, and they understood. He's talking to us, you know. So when he's when he addresses um, uh, the angel of the church of Laodicea, he's talking to the church age of where we are now. Everybody. That's just a representation of so, it. So the crown and the white robe could be just representation of, of, of um, saved Yes, and, it could be. Now, I'm not saying it is. I don't know. Um, I, and I'm not going to presume to know because, once again, I've, I always have had an aversion to folks that, that think that they can tell you that in prophecy, things that have not yet taken place, that this is exactly what it's talking about. Because I don't believe that's the reason prophecy is ever given. I, and I've taught you guys this. Prophecy, in my opinion, is given so that we can look back and say, God told us this before it ever took place. Yeah. So in other that, words, like Paul said, we know in part. Yes, and we prophesy in part. Uh, we, right. We, One day we'll know face to face. Carnal man can't comprehend. Right. Anything. Now, our, our finite, our infinite, I should say, our finite wisdom, our, our wisdom that has limitations, conjures up all kinds of things. You probably heard, I'm going to kind of go on another tangent again. You probably heard that folks talk about the, uh, the scorpions that sting in, in the book of the Revelation and, and uh, these dragons that fly and spit fire and all that all of those things, they, they figured it out. It's a it's a Black Hawk helicopter that shoots out rockets and and the tail of it looks like a scorpion and, and you you might have heard some of that stuff. I mean they've got all types of interpretations for what those things mean and and why in the world do we have to hang a, a carnal picture on on the future events and try to figure out that you know this, it's going to be this country and. Because they're the only one that's got an army of that size that's going to come down through the Euphrates Valley. And, why, you know, why in the world do we have to try to lock ourselves into these finite things? It's because we want to know the future. It's going to validate the future to us. And, and why do we want to know it? Why, why do you want to know? Why do you want to know? Would you like to know about the lottery numbers next Saturday? Absolutely. <laughs> and why? Yeah. To, um. Would you do anything if you knew about it? Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> the reason you want to know is so that you can profit yourself. You can benefit from it. Bills I need to pay for the it's so exactly right. So if yeah. you could figure out prophecy, if you could know what the future was going to hold, literally, uh, man, you would buy certain stocks. 
Uh, you might play yeah. certain numbers. Written by this, written by this. You yeah. might build your house in a certain place. Mm -hmm. You might change countries, man. You might move out if you found out that the United States ends up being with the Antichrist or whatever. You never know what kind of things that you would change based on your carnal wisdom with the knowledge of future events, thinking that somehow you can manipulate that for your good. How are we supposed to live our life? According to uh, the knowledge of future things or according to the leadership of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. We're supposed to check with him every day for everything. If he wants you to move to England instead of United States, then it needs to be moving because God told me to, not because I know that this country is going to fall to Muslimism. Or... We know a hurricane's coming, you leave. <laughs> exactly. It's, it's the future it's knowing the things of the future yeah. that we would take, and even if they were true and you did know them right, you would corrupt them by manipulating them to benefit your own self. And so that's why uh, I've, I've seen, I can't tell you how many revelation mm -hmm. teachings I have saw, and they always go to that, uh, they, they start wanting to explain what's going to happen in the future, and I and I have been so careful with you guys that I'll tell you almost every single session that this is not about future events. Right. It's about the revelation of who he is. And he tells us ahead of time so that when it takes place, we'll go back and say, yep. he really is. The whole world will have that opportunity to know that. They will see it also because there's going to be folks that are going to be saved throughout this whole thing. So just pay attention and watch carefully. Um, and the one thing that we need to know is we need to be born again at the time that God calls us. Brother TJ brought out uh, verse number two, immediately I was in the spirit after verse one says he could come up hither. Uh, the call of God has to be responded to in order for you to be saved. You don't get saved because you go like, oh, this is happening. I must be in the tribulation period. Let me get born again. You, you can't do that. You just won't do that. The book of Thessalonians says if you reject the love of the truth now, you're going to believe the lie later. God said, I will cause you to believe the lie. And if God's going to make you do it, you're going to do it. And it's going to be part of the punishment of your rejection. You can't turn him away with your will now and accept him later with your will then. It's not your will. It's got to be his will manifested in you when god says tj come you got to come then and you can't say god I, i'm not going to come today i'm gonna wait till next after father's day i'm gonna come the next time you know you can't put it off let me live my life and sow all my wicked seeds and then when i get older i'll get saved you're gonna die and go to hell like that because it's not by your will. That's good. That's good right there because you know that most people are saying that it's God. You know, well, it's God's will. It's God's will. Uh, you just said what's God's will. His will. It's it, God's will is that everyone, everyone for whosoever shall come and everything else. That's right. And that means you have a part in it too. It's your faith. It's your faith in God's will. And that's where the people are, that everybody's missing. This you got to surrender to it. They keep looking at it going, well, it's, it's God's will, and I'll just wait, and I'll get it, you know, at the end, or I'll get it then, or whatever, you know. No, it's according to your faith, because even Jesus said, I wonder when the Son of Man returneth unto this earth. Will he find will faith? Will he find faith? That's right. And it is the faith. It's the ones who have the faith who have put their faith in God's will. And that is God's will, just what you just said. Well, I'm, uh, once again, I, we have chased this rabbit to the other county, so I might as well keep going a little bit. <laughs> I, I want to I wanna share something with you guys. Um, and I, I know you've heard me say it before, but I want to kind of refresh it on you. Um, we get so focused on what it takes to get somebody saved that we forget about what it takes to send somebody to hell. Okay, so remember um, we told you about the book of life was written before the foundation of the world, has everybody's name in it, and the way people go to hell is they, their names are blotted out. 
which is contrary to what we were taught that when you get saved, your name is written mm -hmm. into the Lamb's Book of Life. The Bible teaches different. The Bible teaches that that book, it was written before you was ever born. Mm -hmm. Your name was already in it. Mm -hmm. Now, what causes your name to get blotted out? Rejection. 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 That final rejection. I don't know when that final rejection is. It may be when you're alive. It may be when you die and there's no more chance. I don't know. But that final rejection, God knows that final rejection, and your name is blotted out of the book of life. Uh, now, with, with that being said, here's the, um, the thing that I think that's is kind of a, an awakening for me is that um, when we talk about using, as Brother TJ was talking about, using our will and our faith, uh, our faith to come to know Christ, uh, that is, that, that's still a, a work of God. Because the Bible tells us that God has given to every man the measure of faith. Right. So the faith that you use to get saved, you can't take credit for. That's right. It's what he gave you. He's already, he's oh. given you every advantage. So the real deal is, the real thing that you should be looking at is the flip side of the page. And that is what causes these people to go to hell is the fact that they stubbornly will not use Every advantage they've been given, their name's in the book. They've been drawn by the Spirit. They have been enlightened. Their eyes have been opened to the truth. They're being called. They have the faith to believe. They can do it. They have every resource. They, there's no reason for them not to, but what did they do? They stonewall, and they build up their own stubborn pride and will, and they say, no, I'll do this myself. Or they, in whatever their reasoning, they reject that call of God. And when they do that the final time, I don't know how many times God does that with an individual. He's only maybe, uh, I was going to say required, but he's not required to do anything. He, he only has to do it, I guess, one time. Um, but however many times he does it, at that final rejection, their name is blotted out of that book of life. And their doom to eternal damnation is sealed from that time forward. And that, that's what I, I want to make sure we get. Because we're constantly pushing for, you need to get born again. You need to get saved. You need to quit rejecting. We, we talk about you need to believe. You need to receive. You need to quit rejecting. You need to start surrendering. You need to start letting go and letting God. You need to, you need to stop stonewalling and just humble yourself. You humble yourself before God. He resists the proud. He gives grace to the humble. You need to fall on your face and acknowledge that what God just said to you in your heart is right. And, do, and that's what repentance is about. It, it's aligning yourself with God so that you can have that 180. And, when that, and that's the thing about getting born again. It's not about coming to the place where, oh, I see now. Oh, I see Oh, yeah, I can believe now. I understand that he's, you don't understand nothing. You need to understand that you are nothing. He is everything, and that's all you need. Amen. There's a teaching going around that you've got to know certain things before you can get saved. What you need to know is that, that God's, a sinner and God's calling yeah, <laughs> God called on you, and he's paid the price already. Yes, Bona? You're going to be held accountable yep. for everything you say and everything you do, and it's your choice whether it's for God or the devil. Absolutely. Can make it for you. And, if, and God's going to be the judge to make sure you judge right and get what you have. And that starts with our salvation. And when you accept him as personal Savior, when you, or we say accept him, I like the way that uh, Buddy Coon's mama used to say it. He, she used to always give her testimony. she say, he accepted me, which I like that a lot better because that's really the truth. But uh, anyway, once you become a, a, a born-again believer, and you come into the family of God, um, that responsibility of what Bona just said, of uh, it carries throughout the rest of our lives. We somehow have gotten to the place where we think that it's all about getting saved, that moment of confession and profession and being baptized and joining the church. And, uh, but our entire life should be a succession of us surrendering to God 
in every way possible more and more. The breaking of our will, the molding of the new man in us, and the dying of the old man. Yet I see a lot of people that become more stubborn as they move through their Christian life, and they get boastful and proud and, and loud and boisterous and and, 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 and rooted, and, and, and instead of humbling before before the Lord and recognizing that there's no good thing in them except God. And that's the opposite of what Christ told us to do. Christ told us to pick up our cross daily and follow him. Almost. He actually said, let him first deny himself. himself. If any man will come after me, let him first deny himself. And we forget that. The Holy Spirit convicts you to turn from your sinful ways. Right. And turn to God and allow the Holy Spirit to come in and watch and change you. And that's when you get filled with the Holy Spirit to leave God and Jesus. Amen, brother. So we deny ourselves, which means that we don't trust our way anymore. Mm -hmm. We don't trust our own will, our own knowledge, our own um, dreams or visions. You have to let those things go and say, God, I traveled that way all my life till now. Yeah. I, I, I want to I cast that aside. I want to push that away. And I want to trust only your leadership. Uh, what happens with a born-again believer is we have, uh, there's now two spirits in us. I know this confuses people. Nope. There's your spirit that is still there. And now there has been the deposit of the Holy Spirit in you. And that's what Paul talks about walking after the spirit. Uh, he's talking about walking after the, the new deposited Holy Spirit. So anyway, inside of you, if you're going to follow after the Lord and walk after the Spirit, you first have to deny self because you can't exalt both at the same time. There's just, you can't serve two masters. So somebody has to be surrendered or diminished somehow. So you have to deny self so that Christ can be exalted. If you exalt self, then Christ is going to be denied. I don't know if you get that or not. You can't have both being exalted. It doesn't work that way. Beautiful. John the Baptist. You're just right. I must decrease so that he can increase. I love that light and darkness thing. You can't have them both at the same time. You're exactly right. We can't be walking in the spirit and in the flesh at the same time. God can't have his way and me have my way. At the same time. Galatians 2.20, <laughs> it is no longer I who live, but it is Christ who lives within me. Thank you, because I die daily. Amen. That's exactly right. So the surrender. Uh, so we we always looking at how do I get in? How do I become a believer? How do I serve God? How do I do this for the Lord? Stop that. Why don't you back up and say, how do I surrender? How do I quit everything that I am so that he might be everything that he is in me? That's the real secret because your every problem you've ever had since you've been born again and before, every problem you've ever had has been because you chose not to surrender. You stayed with your own will. You chose. Now, I know that a lot of times we think we're doing pretty good. Brother, buddy, I'm a pretty righteous guy. I know the Bible. I can make decisions. You will make decisions, but they will be the wrong ones. If you have anything to do with it, it's contaminated. That's right. That's right. Because our our righteousness is as filthy rags. filthy rags. So the best that we've ever done, Mark, the best that I've ever done in myself is filthy is is nothing but waste in his eyes. Dung. Dung. Exactly. It's a it's a pile of nasty, filthy. D -d -d wasteful trash. And so the best that I've ever been was the was the time that I stumbled down to my knees, broken and unable to make a decision for myself. When I stumbled to my knees and I surrendered and said, God, I don't know. You got to do this. And now you can take this from scripture. We just there was a lot of scripture you guys were just quoting. Or you could take it from a guy what been there. Amen? I've been to the bottom, where I thought was the bottom for me anyway. I, I'm sure it could probably get worse. But for me, I felt like the end of the world. And you may have been to the bottom where you felt like it was the end of everything, the loss of all things as you know it. 
where you just say, God, I don't have any. I still go back to that song, just as I am, without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me. And in that song, it says, "No, in, thy, in my hand, no prize I bring. Simply to the cross I cling. The idea that I don't have anything to offer. I'm not smart enough. I'm not good enough. I just come to you and I surrender my everything to you, including, and most importantly, my will. My will. My will, let my will be lost in thy will. So that whenever I move, it's not my will, but it's your will that is being exemplified. You know that uh, that thing where the, that song, I think it's a country song or something that says, uh, I never saw a, a hearse with a trailer hitch. <laughs> you know, talking about that, and it's talking about a dead man that can't take his money, can't take his possessions and all this. And I got to thinking about it, and I said, I never saw a, Christian's li a Christian life with a trailer hitch. You can't, you can't bring your stuff with you. You have to let it go. That's good. I can't do this. And the Holy Spirit will tell you, I never asked you to. That's exactly right. Yeah. Do, do we humble ourselves as that little child yeah. and allow the Holy Spirit to take our self-righteousness out of us right. and put Christ's righteousness in us? Help us Lord. I don't think we, we do that very hold, much. We want to hold to ourselves. And that right there is our choices. Absolutely. <clears throat> Absolutely. And that's our problem today. Amen. <clears throat> now, if we keep following this line, I'm which is... Over here and get on my knees. Yeah. If we keep following this line, which I'm okay with, you think about now the commandments that Jesus gave to us, that we love the Lord God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love our neighbor as ourselves. Those things start to become very logical because we now have we've lost our own will and we're walking in the will and the light because he talked about light and darkness the light and the love and the grace and the mercy of someone who is in us that is greater than us so that we now are we're loving our heavenly father and we're we're following his footsteps and we are loving people like Jesus loved people yeah. And so, you know, and instead of using the laws and the commandments to judge everyone, that's right. Wrote on our heart, we're living it and carrying it with us and letting them people see it in us and we'll know what. And a little doing. further down that line, just one more step down that line. I know that line goes a long way, but one more step down that line where he says to love your enemies and do good to them that despitefully use you. And we all go like, hey, somebody smite me on one cheek. I, you know what? But the, so the idea is that he did it. And he's, he's saying this to us, and we're going like, how can we, are we supposed to follow that example? Here's how you do it, by the diminishing of you and the exaltation of him. Yes, ma'am. I've also found that the more I'm in Christ and the more that I'm actually surrendering my will to him, it is easier for me to love people, too. Not just logical, it's easier. Well, it should become easier because it shouldn't be you loving them anymore. It is, be, remember... That's Christ in me. Let my will become thine. So it's his will in me that is just being manifested through me. Uh, TJ said it just a moment ago. So that if I live, it's not I that live. It's no longer I that live, but Christ that lives in me. And I'm not being critical here. I'm just going to state a, a very observable fact. Uh, Christian people living today are not exampling Christ living today. We're a bunch of church people that are going around trying to do it our way and then putting the tag of Jesus is Lord on it. And that's not the way that he intended it. What he intends is for us to humble ourselves, stop doing things our way, and let him guide us and lead us. And, 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 and so whenever we do live or when we do love or we do act or we do rebuke, or we do praise, or whatever we do, in all things that we do, it's Christ that is doing it through us. And that is a goal that, and, and if you've ever had the opportunity, if you've ever had the chance to one time have God move in your life where you just knew that for this one time, God did that. It wasn't me. It was God. It is such an humbling 
exalting yeah. experience that you've ever known. Well, I want to be there all the time, but I stand in my own way. I want to be there all the time. I've had those times when God's done that, and it's been so much glory, so much, so much splendor. And I'd love to be living like that all the time, but Buddy is such a wretched individual. He's constantly wanting to run his own life, and he's constantly raising his head up, and he's constantly standing in the way of the, of the precedence of the Spirit of God having um, preeminence in, in my life. At that nursing home, that's where I came up with that thing. It's about him, it's about them, and then it's about him. And it's it, it, people, if we will just realize this, it's all about God, it's all about everyone else, and then it's about me. And if I will do this, I guarantee you, if you, if, if an individual will take that to heart, they will do on to others as they, if they were doing it on to the Lord. Amen. And even that's what Colossians 3, 23 says. Do everything you do as doing it unto the Lord. Yeah. And I, uh, Brother TJ and I had a moment a couple of weeks ago. Brother TJ mm -hmm. has accepted the call to be our hospital minister. And we've uh, anointed him and we're getting him positioned for that work. And I'm going to share a comment that he and I had a conversation, I guess I should say. And he said to me, he said, you know, I'm in, I do the, the nursing home ministry too. And he said, so if I get a call like on a Wednesday morning, you know, he says, uh, you know, what do I do? And uh, yeah, you got a hospital waiting to be visited. Somebody needs you. And you got your ministry at the nursing home that are conflicting on the schedule. He said, what do I do? And he'll tell you that my answer to him was, that's simple. He's going like, what, really? Simple, you ask him. Because your number one priority is not the nursing home. Your number one priority is not the hospital. Your number one priority is to serve the true and the living God and to let him use you. So you have to humble yourself down and say, God, I don't know what's right to do in this situation. I need you to guide me and lead me. I'll do what you tell me. I just need to know. And this whole reopen church thing, um, you know, when to open and how to open and what things we can do and how we do them and when we stop doing it, all of those things is such a complexing thing. And I have, I have many advisors, and I appreciate all the input. Don't get me wrong. But I have many advisors. But the one thing that I have to do is I have to say, God, what is your will? you tell me. Because I got to tell you, if, if Anthony Fauci, the little guy you keep seeing stand beside Trump all the time, if that little fella stood here today and told me this is how we're supposed to run it, he's just a man. Yep. And he's working out of his own <clears throat> wisdom. Yeah. And the wisdom of man is so far below God that the Bible says it's like how far the heavens are above the earth. That's it's the wisdom of God that I need, not the wisdom of Anthony Fauci. Yep. It's the wisdom of God I need, not the CDC, which I'm still looking at those things, and I consider those things, and I think about those things, and I ask God, is that right? Is that right? And I, I know that there's uh, folks are screaming on both sides of the aisle. I know they're screaming on both sides of the aisle. You shouldn't be doing that. And other folks are saying you need to you need to not listen to all that. We can go back to things as normal. They're screaming from both sides. And I'm saying, God, you tell me what to do. You tell me what to do. And we and then whatever happens is his responsibility. You could say to me, Well, brother buddy, you're afraid the church might get sued if something happens. Well, if I do what he says, that's his problem, not mine. Acts you know? five twenty eight. Yep. Better to obey God than men. Than men. If I can, if I can get that, I, in order to do that, you, the the big thing I got to do is I've got to deny myself because inside of me, my spirit is screaming. Now you're smart enough to figure this out. You need to walk, you know, and you need to, and I, and so I've got this loud, boisterous fat boy inside of me that keeps trying to tell me that I have the wisdom to work this thing out, and I have to keep squashing that. 
and saying, I don't want to hear what you have to say. I want to hear what he has to say. I want to walk after the spirit, not after the flesh. If we walk after the flesh, we are not serving God. I don't care who you are or what you're doing. You're, not, you're serving yourself. You're not serving God. So God help me to crush my will. How often I got to do that? Every day, all the time. Sometimes every hour. All the time. I wish I wish it was a one and done. Yeah. I do wish. Uh, you know, we'd have revival and we'd bring people up there and drive a spike in them or something. I don't know, but uh, but it's not a one and done. It's a continual thing. All like the time. The example Jesus gave us in the wilderness. Right. How many times did the devil was him? That's right. And that symbolized him going out into the world, and that symbolized us going back out into the world. After we get saved, and how do we handle it? That's right. Get behind me, Satan. I serve on the Lord. Amen. And for the his entire existence on this earth, uh, Brother Bona, we see that Jesus never failed to spend time with the Father. The night before he was to be crucified, he went to the garden to pray. He begged with the Father. Man, I would have been <laughs> gathered up with the disciples. How are we going to handle this? You know, what's our plan? When the people show up, what's our plan? But instead, he said, if possible, let this cup pass from me, not thy will. Not, not my, my will, will thy, thy will. So we find him in prayer. He never forsook the, the guidance and the leadership of God and did not depend upon his own wisdom. Although he was God in the flesh, he did not walk by his own wisdom. He said, you know, I know you're thinking I'm crazy, so I'm going to tell you this. Jesus himself said, the works I do are not mine. And the words I speak are not mine, but the Father's. So he didn't walk by his own wisdom. And so when he says that you can do what I've done, he's not saying that you have the power to raise the dead and you have the power to heal the blind. What he's saying is you can be surrendered to the Father just like I was, and then the Father can do through you everything he done through me, which is raise the dead, open the blind eyes, Amen? Walk according to faith. All of those things. We can be just like Christ in this world because Christ didn't operate because he was God in the flesh. He operated as a spirit-led, spirit-filled, indwelled, surrendered individual to the will of the Father. And then he says, now you go and do likewise. Mm -hmm. Wow. I don't know how we got so far back to this. It was that rabbit that went by. But we have been talking some good stuff today. Uh, so we're we're looking. We're going to open up next week. <laughs> I promise, Lord willing, the best as I can, we're going to try. We're going to seek to open up next week in chapter number four, verse number one. We'll get off. We're off the charts. Uh, we'll be back on um, the scripture in chapter number four. And we're talking about the rapture of the church. We're talking about the fact that we're living in the days just before the trumpet is going to sound, just before the call is going to come out. Listen, that's going to be a key day for, for, uh, for us. And I, I want to say this before we go home. It's a key day. In fact, there's going to be a great separation. But it's also a key day and it's going to be a great reunion. Right? So we're, those of us who are believers are going to be separated from those who are unbelievers. Some of us go to the same church. Some of us attend the same classes and the same Bible studies. Believers will be separated from unbelievers. It was Charlie a while ago, I think, that said, uh, God already knows who they are. You don't have to purge them out. He already knows. So when he calls out the believers, there's a separation of believers from unbelievers. I believe churches will be able to go on almost unhindered for the most part. That's sad. That is sad. But it's the Laodicean church. It's cold and dead already. Or I said it should say lukewarm and complacent. So the, the, the separation between the believers, the true believers, and the pretend believers. There's a reunion. The reunion is, is that the believers that have already gone on are going to be met by the ones who are now being called up. So your loved one that's gone on before, your mom or your dad. The sad part is John's going to be in the same family. Say that again. The sad part is John's going to be in the same family. 
The separation you're talking about? Yeah. Yeah, Miss Billy said the sad part is that some's going to be in the same family. That is that is the case. It's not some, it's the case. It is going to be, um, it's going to be the rule. Right. Uh, you know, and all rules have exceptions, but it's going to be the rule. And the rule is, is that in, in every family, there's going to be a separation. It may not be between spouses. It may not be in the particular household. But there's going to be some loved ones in your family that are going to be taken. And there's going to be some loved ones that are going to be left. And it's going to be a separation for families. That's just, that's the fact of the matter. That's why we constantly, constantly talk about the idea that you need to be a good witness to those that are in your family. And I know that a lot of people say, well, I think... To the best of my knowledge, everybody in my family saved. Guys, listen, you can't know somebody else's heart. That's right. Just because there's been a profession of faith in them doesn't mean anything. All you can really know is about you. And there's going to come a time that there's, it's going to be revealed who are truly in, who are out. And there's really nothing you can do about that other than being genuine yourself. Between you and God. That's right. And if you'll be genuine yourself and you'll let God work in you like we've been talking about, diminish your will and let his will be exalted, then God may use you to bring those folks into a real relationship. They need to see what it looks like to see somebody truly surrendered to God. Right. Boy, if that could sink into your mind and mine, that would, that would go a long way in how we walk out of this room today. Well, it's the truth. If you... The, you know that saying, the truth shall set you free. If you walk in the truth, I'm telling you, if you just speak the truth, walk in the truth, the truth will set them free. Not you. Right. Not anything about you. I don't care if you are the pastor that stands up on the pulpit. It's the truth that you have spoken that will set me free or anybody else that will receive it. Chris Caldwell's watching. He just reminded me of something Daddy used to say all the time. And um, uh, here's the idea is that uh, uh, the, the revelation of where you are, there's only two types of people. There's saved and there's lost. There's saved, they're saved people uh, who may not be living like they're saved, and then there's lost people that are living like they're saved. I don't know if that makes sense to you or not. There's lost people that live a life that has, is a pretense of salvation. And then there's saved people that are living such a defeated life that they look as though they may be lost. Who can know the difference? Okay. Only God. And so with that, with that calling out, uh, many may stand before him. You're either in or you're out. There's no, my point is there's no in between. There's no, some, there's no person that is halfway in or halfway out. We talk about backsliders. Oh, backsliders are, are saved if they're born again. If they're not born again, they're lost. That's all there is to it. There's only two categories. We gave you the sheet that we looked at last week that had the judgments on them. There was only two judgments. There was the judgment seat of Christ for believers, and then there's the great white throne judgment of unbelievers. There's only the two. There's not one in the middle for folks that decided to switch in the middle or, or, or was halfway in or halfway out or... Uh, came out of purgatory or anything like that. There's no other judgment. There's the judgment of the lost and the judgment of the saved only. And he's the one that knows your heart, therefore determining which judgment you will stand at. So um, I just uh, I want to make sure that we understand it. Today it seemed like God wanted us to recognize that it's up to us not to do anything except surrender. It's time that we lay our, our weapons down. It's time that we put down our resistance. It's time that we stop rebelling against God. It's time that we stop thinking that we know uh, anything about how we're supposed to be live our Christian life and just start, um, what did we say earlier um, that Jessica was talking about? If any man will deny himself and then take up his cross and follow me. He said, if any man will come after me, let him first deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. We can't walk in his footsteps till we first learn how to put down the old man.
Got to put him down. Anybody else before we dismiss in prayer? It's been a good study this morning. Thank you all very much. And uh, I think sometimes chasing the rabbits takes us into some really beautiful places through valleys of, of green clover, if you will. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the blessedness of being able to share God's word today. Lord, I thank you that uh, we have experienced a movement of your spirit today that has spoken to us, as Brother TJ said, has spoken truth to us. And the truth will make us free. If we'll know the truth and we'll receive the truth and we will, re we will believe, truly believe and receive, then we can walk in a newness of life that will be freedom to us. And I ask God that we might surrender right now today. As, uh, I want to ask for those that are watching um, and those that are here today in this room, may we have a great desire to humble ourselves before God. Lord, may we break our, may our will be broken. May, may we decide today that it is better for us not to have lived than to live after our own lust and our own desires. May we decide today that the only way that we choose to take another breath on this earth is that Christ be manifested in us and not us ourselves. I give you glory for who you are. I ask God that we can be more effective witnesses through surrender. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Thank you guys for being with us. Lord willing, we'll see you next week. Chapter 4, verse number 1.